Welcome to Valley Heat. I'm Doug Duguay. This is a podcast about the neighborhood. My neighborhood, the Burbank Rancho Equestrian District right here in Los Angeles County. Brought to you by Janny Cakes. Jan Robinson's Janny Cakes. Let me tell you about them. Anyone who knows Jan Robinson, well, you know her shirts. It's not just a shirt. It's a Jan Robinson shirt. But Jan also makes uh, lizard-themed and ladybug-themed hummingbird feeders. She makes some pants, jackets. And she just started making what she's calling breakfast ice cream. I mean, don't you wake up in the morning and kind of want ice cream? Well, you can. You can have a Janny cake. Just grab it out of the freezer and have a fun morning. This is something new that Jan's come up with, and she's calling it meal replacement ice cream. You can just have ice cream in replacement of a meal because it's meal replacement ice cream. So you can have a Janny cake for breakfast. You can have a Janny cake for lunch, and then you have a sensible dinner, and then you can have another Janny cake after dinner. Who says you can't eat ice cream for breakfast? Or at least that's what Jan thinks. And so she wanted to make something that people could enjoy right after getting out of bed. One of the things I like about it is just breaking a pattern. You know, I'll wake up, I'll grab a Janny cake, I'll just eat ice cream, I'll get back in bed and I'll just watch a show that I would normally watch at like 9 p.m. But it's not 9 p.m. It's 9 a.m. I'll just start watching something on Netflix. My son will walk in and go, hey, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm just breaking a pattern, honestly. And it doesn't just have to be a breakfast thing. You can have it for lunch. You can have it for dinner. It can be a full diet plan. So you can have Janny cakes in the morning. And then you can have, for lunch, you can have Janny cakes. And then at dinner, you can have dinner and then have Janny cakes after dinner. And then do it all over again the next day. I mean, why not start your day off fun? Jan Robinson's Janny cakes. It's ice cream for breakfast. And even for lunch and even for dinner. and that's local Burbank band Cephalopods are people you can check out all their music on the Patreon page the Valley Heat Patreon page and if you want to join the Patreon you can get weekly episodes of the Valley Heat I know it takes about a month or so to make a regular episode of Valley Heat but you can also listen to the weekly episodes on the Patreon page the weekly episodes are about 20 minutes each and it's basically the same show it's just 20 minutes and it's called Good Morning Burbank Just like this show, it includes all the music from Cephalopods or People and all the stories that are going on in the Rancho Equestrian District. So if you want to be part of that, then you should do that. And if you don't, I mean, that's too bad because it's really for your own safety. So check that out if you want. I mean, I know it costs money. You can still just keep listening to this for free if you want. That's fine. You're not going to really miss anything except for just having more fun. And I won't really make money. Which, And I say that not to make you feel guilty, but to make you feel pressured. But you do get free stuff on the Patreon if you are into stuff like that. And how's this? I'll give you a T-shirt if you're one of the first five people to join after this podcast airs. I'll give you a free Jan Robinson T-shirt or Valley Heat T-shirt of your choice. All right, let's start this episode of Valley Heat. These are the Chronicles of the Rancho Equestrian District in Burbank, California. These are the events taking place in my house, around my house, and in my neighborhood. There's some other neighborhoods, too. Toluca Lake, I don't really include a lot of that stuff because those guys kind of think they're better than we are. But they're not. They're just another place. I saw a therapist. My wife has me to see a therapist, and so I tried that. I'm going to talk about that in the episode. Most of you know that like the whole guy I follow the DA. Anyway, we'll talk about that now in a second. So, I guess we can probably, probably end, this end, this part. Part. Okay, end this part. Okay, okay, it's just end this part. part. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is an update I with... Okay, well, you can hear that, and that's the first thing that I want to talk about. Okay, that's someone's bird. That's... You know that Candace, my former pool guy's wife, is staying here. And keep in mind, this is someone who actually showed up unannounced, and she was not invited to stay here. 
but she needed a place to stay because she was mad at Pete and she had nowhere else to go. So I let her stay here. I think the main point is that I really got to figure out who's using my garbage can as a drug drop so I can clear Pete's name and get him off the hook. The longer the DEA thinks that Pete's the guy who is using my garbage can to distribute drugs, the longer I'm being held responsible for everything that's going wrong in Pete and Candace's life. So now Candace is here in my house with me. I mean, I this person, I've never known anyone to take more showers than Candace. It's like she lives in the shower, and when she's not in the shower, she listens to that to Rick Springfield song, Jesse's Girl, all the time. I mean, I used to like that song. She's got it playing on her phone like it's some kind of soundtrack that she walks around with. I mean, it's at first I thought it was, might be kind of cute, but I feel it's almost like a medical issue at this point. I mean, she should be in the hospital. There's just no way that one person could listen to one song this much without having some kind of problem. So anyway, I wanted to play for you what happened and why you're hearing that thing in the background. So listen to this. Is that someone's bird in a cage out there? That's green banana. It's my brother's parrot that I said I would watch for him. Well, you said you'd watch your brother's parrot and keep it here? I didn't say you could keep a parrot. Well, that's here. because I didn't ask. Doug, what do you want me to do? Just let a bull parrot fly away? You didn't think you had to ask me first? Well, where is it supposed to go? I don't know. To a parrot place. To a parrot person's house. I had a feeling you'd act like okay. this. Okay, well, I'm sorry, but you got to say your brother and he can't keep his parrot here. Well, I can't do that because I owe him big time. That, this is not my problem at all. Can you always all. help me bring the cage in? No, because we're not going to have a parrot. He can't just stay out there. It's cold. Uh -oh. you just help me carry this? The cage is huge. Michael, that one. Grab the other side. I am grabbing it. I'm carrying it. A bird cool. into the house. Michael, that one. Is he saying something? What's he saying? Michael Douglas. It's all he says. Michael, that one. I mean, honestly, it's terrifying. You're, that's all your bird says is Michael Douglas? How? I mean, find out what's wrong. Apparently, it was a rescue. Her brother got this as a rescue bird, and that's just, they don't know why. That's all it says. And I like Michael Douglas. I got no problem with Michael Douglas, but I just can't imagine living a happy life with a bird who just repeated his name over and over. I mean, the, I guess the truth is I don't really hear it anymore. I mean, maybe that's the case with her brother, too, because it just becomes white noise after a while. But it's her brother's bird. I don't know how long we're supposed to keep it. I guess he's in the middle of some kind of move and he can't have the bird right now. But Candace is still mad at Pete, and I'm hoping they get back together soon. There's actually more development with that. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But before I do, I wanted to talk about, you probably remember my wife, who was still up at her dad Chuck's house, because she was upset that I didn't fire Pete when we thought he was taking, when, when we thought he was using the garbage can as a drug drop. She's still up at her dad Chuck's house. And the last time I drove up to her dad's house to try and talk to her, I actually drove up there because I needed to take some money out of the account to bail Pete out of jail when he gave me some Ambien. But she told me that it was okay. She she agreed to let me take that money out, but she said, I'll do it under the condition that you go to therapy because she thinks I have some issues with getting too involved with things in the neighborhood. I think she might not understand that, you know, I am an insurance adjuster. I do a lot of detective work. So I don't think she understands that it's in my nature to get my hands dirty when it comes to stuff like this. But the point is I did what she asked and I made an appointment with a therapist right here in Burbank. And I had my first appointment. I recorded that session, which I know is a little unorthodox for a therapy session. But like I said, when I started the podcast, I'm going to record everything. I want you to know what's going on. So I'm going to play that session for you right after this promotion. Well, it happened. The foosball tournament has been postponed because someone got punched in the face really hard. And if you're a true fan of foosball, then you know that's just the way foosball goes. The minute someone gets punched in the face, it's on. For the 10th year in a row, the Burbank Youth Foosball Table Youth Foosball Championship Tournament has been postponed due to a serious injury to a serious face. If you thought this wasn't going to be as good as it's always been, you were wrong. If you've already got tickets, hold on to them. And if you don't have tickets yet, too bad. This event is double sold out. Kidding, there's a couple tickets left. Reserve tickets to use foosball tables, because next Wednesday it's going down starting at 4.30 a.m. Get right back up. 
haven't served them all. But can you take a good gut punch? And show me, show me what I punch you in the face. I tricked you, you see I tricked you. And that's lesson number one in foosball. It's the first time you don't get what you want, you gotta keep trying to get what you want, you gotta get what you need. I tricked you, you see I tricked you, but you better get back up in the foosball. Get me knocked down once, then you get back up, and if you're knocked down twice, then you know somebody's gotta bleed. I tricked you. All right, so like I was saying, I went to my first therapy session recently because my wife, Faye, wants me to start going to therapy because she feels like I'm getting too involved in some of the stuff that's been going on around the neighborhood and some of the stuff that's been going on around the house, particularly with Pete. And so I did a little research on some therapy, some therapists around here, and I found this guy, Leon Driscoll, who is over on Riverside and technically over in Toluca Lake area, which is kind of a ritzier part of Burbank. But he seemed like an interesting enough person, and I thought I'd give it a shot. So I recorded the session, which I felt like it was my right to do because it was my session. And anyway, here's what happened. Check it out. So honestly, I didn't even know how I was going to feel about this. My wife wanted me to do this, and I wasn't sure. But now that I'm here, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, and I'm glad you were able to get an appointment because uh, I just uh, finished a book, and I'm very busy promoting it. Well, you wrote a book, like a book on therapy? Yeah. What, what is it? What's it called? It's a self-help book. It's called uh, I Can't Wait to Never See You Again. What, what? It's called what? I Can't Wait to Never See You Again. That's the title of the book? It's about cutting off toxic uh, people, cutting out toxic people in your life, which is something nobody, not enough people do. And it's about getting people out of your life? Actually, I, you know, I don't really want to go into the book. Um, I'd rather you buy it. It's on Amazon. It, oh, it's a published book. It's an e-book on Amazon, and I would prefer it if you buy it that way. Oh, I see. So it's not... Actually, published, published. Well, it's published as an ebook, and you could buy it on Amazon. That sounds pretty published to me. Right, it's on Amazon, but did who's the publishing company? Well, I I started a com- publishing company. So, I mean, technically, it's not published by a publishing company, unless I guess you could say yours is a publishing company. Yeah, it's published. I mean, yes, I'm the publishing company, but that means it's out there. You can buy it. That means it's published. Like, I don't know why there's. Well, I mean, a- to be fair, when people usually say that, they mean a real established company has put their book out there. I'm a viable publishing company, and I will be one until... What do you mean viable? You're the one who said viable. No, I didn't say viable. No, you, you said, said viable. viable. I mean, I was making an argument about viability, but I didn't say the well, word. Who's to say my company's not legitimate? Well, I guess right now, no one is to say it's legitimate, but a publishing company is a company that publishes over several decades and then people go okay that's a publishing company and when they put a book out we'll trust that that's a real book so if when random house put out their first book they weren't a publishing company yet no i mean not a legitimate one in the beginning they weren't and then eventually they were you know what i think you're being kind of negative and and not supportive of my endeavor well i don't mean to not be supportive of your endeavor i'm just you didn't say hey great you published a book congratulations you worked really hard on writing a book you said oh that's not a legitimate company yeah I didn't say, congratulations, you published a book, because you didn't publish a book. You pu- you wrote something, and then you put it on the internet. That's publishing. That's not publishing. That's basically a blog with a price tag. People pe- people have bought it and liked it. I, mean. I don't know why we really need to talk about this. All I'm, tr- I'm just trying to tell you if you're going to bring uh, clients in and tell them that you published a book, you might want to be upfront about the fact that you actually did not publish a book. You just wrote something. It's, there's a company that published it. That's published. I mean, I technically it's an S corp. So it's an S corp. So it's just it's just a shell that is you're calling a thing. To, you're gaslighting me. I don't. We don't really need to get into it. I just think you I think should you just, know. I think you, you, this is some kind of issue with you. You haven't accomplished enough in your life, and you're taking this out on me because you obviously probably came here to talk about your failures with um, relationships or your understanding your emotions. Well, that is why I came. This is therapy office well yeah. i don't want to talk to somebody who thinks i'm a failure look i just want to say i didn't mean to upset you i just wanted to clarify well you upset me and you clarify okay it's possible um, to do both things and you did them look, with great success all right well anyway i just want to say i'm sorry and you know, have a good day yeah I, that's what i was just gonna say all right i'm gonna take off look i just want to say you're not a published author 
Just because you started a publishing Goodbye. company. Okay. All right, so you heard that. The first thing the guy says to me when I sit down on the couch is I published a book. He said, I, I can't even believe you got in to talk to me. I barely have time with all my book stuff. I'm not trying to be mean to the guy. I just, I'm saying don't push yourself as a published author if you're not actually a published author. Publishing your own book, I mean, that's like cool that you did that. But let's not act like the New York Times is waiting for you in the lobby. And could you just hurry up and tell me what your problems are so I can win my Pulitzer? And this is that Toluca Lake stuff, you know. They're over there, and the, those guys like to act like it's this ritzy part of Burbank. All the therapists are writing books and ordering really high-end salads for delivery and buying really expensive candles. It's a thing over there where they just buy these really expensive candles. I, I mean, there's a candle and a pillow store in Toluca Lake. It's called something like branch and paper there's so many stores in toluca lake that are just two words connected by an ampersand like water and ash and you see that and you go oh, i can't afford that i don't have ampersand money i mean in toluca lake if you're gonna walk into a store you better be climbing out of a ferrari because they're gonna need to see some id or at least like a couple selfies of you doing some kind of high-end activity and you just want to go guys it's candles and yeah they your candle smells really nice but your candle and your salad doesn't put you on the New York Times bestseller list. And here's something else about that therapist. There's more to the conversation because listen to what he said after I left. Th this is from the same recording. Look, I just want to say you're not a published author just because you started a publishing Goodbye. company. Goodbye. Okay. So that's me. I just left, but I forgot my phone in his office. It was sitting on the couch recording everything. And this is what he said after I closed the door. Goodbye. Okay. What a lunatic. I close the door, the guy calls me a lunatic. He's a therapist. I mean, this is a guy whose business is to help people who have some issues. I mean, everyone's kind of a lunatic. I mean, that's his business. And it was at least a couple minutes before I realized I forgot my phone in his office. So I have a full recording of what was going on in there when I left. Listen to this. Hey, did my receptionist give you a weird look on the way in? I don't know if I can keep doing this. Like, what happened? I found Mike looking at my phone. Yeah, you have to delete. You can't do this. Guy's next client comes in, he's having an affair with her. She says, Mike was looking at my phone, and he says, oh yeah, you gotta delete. That's not even all that happens, listen to this. Yeah, you, you have to delete. I can't do this, I'm like, I'm like becoming my mother. Yeah, that's a good point, I can see that. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, you think I'm becoming my mother? Look, Don't I, I told you, I that, can't okay? be your therapist and have this relationship with you, it's unethical. I am paying $250 an hour. First of all, it's not $250, this is, there's a copay. Uh, Sorry, it's Doug. Sorry, I left my phone in there. You might just grab it. Oh God, I hate this guy. What? Who is that? I'm really sorry to interrupt. I, I'm I'm in a session. I'm really sorry about that. I forgot my phone. Oh, oh hi. Hey. Oh, hi. You were uh, two houses up. You're married to Mike. Oh, yep. Bianca, you're Gwen, and I'm Doug uh, Duguay. I, you're hi. my neighbor. Yes. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Actually, I'm sorry hi. I even said anything. Let me just. Right, it's right there. Sorry about that. I, I do that all that's, the time. That's okay. I do it all that's the time. Okay. We all forget things. All right. Well, bye, you guys. Well, it's great. Nice to see you very much. I walk in there. It's Gwen Bianca. Mike Bianca's wife is in there. And he's still charging her for the sessions. She says, you know, this has turned out to be a pretty expensive affair. He says, well, it's not that expensive because there's a copay. Not to mention, he tells her that I hates me. He's like, I hate this guy. Why? I mean, because... Okay, well, you hate me, but you got to go telling everyone about it? Your client, who's also my neighbor, who you're also having an affair with? I mean, do you want to read this guy's book? Which, by the way, we never even talked about his book. It's called, I Can't Wait to Never See You Again, In Defense of Ending Relationships That Aren't Really Working Out. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. What's called here? I can't wait. I can't wait to never see you again in defense of ending toxic relationships. I got it written down here because I've got a spot for it in a minute. This guy bought ad time on the show a couple months ago, I had no idea. And I know it's strange that I would play the audio from that encounter in there and the relationship they're having, but it's not a secret. I walked up the street the other day just to talk to Mike Bianca and tell him that I saw Gwen at that office and he already knew about it. He knows about the whole affair. Gwen was in the middle of moving out. And Mike said, you can talk about whatever you want on the podcast. Gwen said, yeah, I don't care. Do whatever you want. I mean, honestly, I don't even know if either of them really meant that. It's almost like they were having a little competition on who cared less about what I talked about on the show. But anyway, I took them at their word. I mean, it was a pretty nasty fight. And Mike's kind of freaking out. He's dealing with it by buying a lot of hummingbird feeders. And I'm going to touch on that a little later. But the worst part about it is Mike recommended that book to Gwen. 
she read it and ended up going to see Leon for sessions, and she ended up having an affair with the author. And we're putting author in the largest quotes possible. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the book is called I Can't Wait to Never See You Again in defense of ending toxic relationships. He probably told her to end the relationship. I mean, toxic? Mike isn't toxic. I mean, he does have a hummingbird feeder problem. I mean, the guy's got a lot of hummingbird feeders over there. I mean, ever since Gwen left, I think he's kind of addicted to it. He's got at least 150 hummingbird feeders over there. I mean, everyone loves hummingbirds, but at some point it goes from being real cute to being an infestation. And it's actually kind of turned into a hazard around the neighborhood. There's one swarm of them over by Mike's house that Dean Fernari thought they were attacking him. He pepper sprayed these hummingbirds. And you're thinking, oh, they must have hurt a lot of hummingbirds. Nope, it just made them more angry. They're fine. And so now the city's going to have to step in. Animal control's getting involved. And I'll be honest, I blame this guy, Leon, for the whole thing. I mean, if Gwen hadn't had this thing with him, I don't think Mike would be buying all these hummingbird feeders. And we wouldn't have all these birds running around attacking cats and stuff. And they have. This hummingbird swarm attacked Gary Janthony's cat. I mean, the point is, I think I'm going to have to find a new therapist. And possibly a lawyer after this show airs. But I'll tell you one thing about me. If you're going to call me a lunatic when I sit down on your therapy couch, then I'm going to air the audio from the affair you're having with my neighbor on my show. But like I said, there's a new therapist on the horizon somewhere out there. And meanwhile, I do want to get back to Pete and Candace and what's going on with them here at the house. And I'm going to do that right after this promotion. You know, life is hard, especially with other people. Someone once said that life would be meaningless were it not for sharing that life with another person. Or there was a saying that was very similar to that, right? No. The notion that we need to share our life with another person in order to give it meaning is a false notion. That's not to say it's bad to share your life with someone, but maybe it is. Possibly. I mean, does anyone really know? It's 50-50, the best case. Pick someone, anyone. And the truth is, you just don't need them. Does anyone you know do this type of stuff? Do they drive or talk aggressively? Or not listen? Or blame you for petty stuff just because you're standing there? Or just because you're not standing there? Or maybe they're really super nice most of the time. Just long enough for you to forget that their specialty is surgically placed emotional bullying. Well, guess what? That's everyone you've ever known. So do yourself a favor and just pare it all down because there's very little room in your head to deal with someone else's stuff. So pick like two or three people tops and just hope for the best. Or really just don't pick any of them. Learn all about these principles and I can't wait to never see you again in defense of ending toxic relationships. Available now on Amazon and Audible and leondriscoll.biz. Published by Driscoll Global International Publishing a subsidiary of Driscoll Global International Continental. Leon Driscoll, President. Check it out. I can't wait to never see you again. I wrote you an email I never hit send, but I'll tell you what it said. It said, I can't wait to never see you again. Another is far too soon, even if you multiplied it by ten. Never times ten. That's when I want to see you again. Another ring self help books on Amazon. So I've got an update on Pete, my former pool guy, and his arraignment. His arraignment is coming up. Just a quick recap. Pete, my former pool guy, he I thought he was using my garbage can as a drug drop. And so does the, the DEA actually still thinks he's doing it. He's not. They won't believe me, though. I'm trying to get him off the hook. I'm trying to figure out who is doing it. What we know is that it's a white El Camino that pulls up to the house and grabs something out of my garbage can really quickly and drives away. We know about the White El Camino because I've got a doorstep app. I've got that doorstep app. It's like Facebook for your neighborhood. It's a camera that films stuff outside of your house, and then you can share it on this social network that's really local to see if anyone can help you figure it out. It's kind of hard because everyone's faces are blurry, but it's great to have one of these cameras if you just want to see what it looks like when someone steals your Amazon packages. And you can't tell what anyone looks like in this footage. The police are like, can you describe the guy that took your package? And you go, yeah. 
He looks like what everyone looks like in that night vision camera. He's green, skeleton kind of looking with glowing demon eyes. Does that sound like the guy you're looking for? Anyway, my neighbor Mike Bianca got some footage of this white El Camino pulling up to the garbage and grabbing this package. So I've been doing some research around the neighborhood. And so you think easy, right? A 1983 restored El Camino white. That's going to be, we're going to find that car, right? No, it turns out. It's a community vehicle. There's 12 restored 1983 white El Caminos in the community center, and anyone who works for the Burbank Rancho Equestrian District can have access to one of these cars. Turns out Frank Sinatra donated 20 of these cars to the Rancho Equestrian District back in the 80s. He got them for his wife who loved the car, and then she hated the house, and she also hated the cars, and she hated him because she left him, and then he was just stuck with these cars, and he just gave them to the district. One of them, Randy Poole, has one of these cars because Randy Poole and his brothers in the band Cephalopods of People, they live in an old Frank Sinatra castle over in Toluca Lake. For a while, Randy thought that Frank Sinatra was actually his father. Randy's the one brother in the Cephalopods of People group who are all brothers. He's the one brother who they don't know who, the, who his father is. And he thought it was Frank Sinatra for a while. He realized now, he knows now that it's not, but now he thinks it's uh, Brian De Palma is his father because Brian De Palma owned the castle before they were living there. Um, it's a different story. I'll talk about that later. I mean, these guys are like the monkeys over there in that castle, except that Randy is he lives in the basement, he's a shut-in, and he is obsessed with solos, guitar solos and otherwise, and he's also obsessed with figuring out who his real dad was. But anyway, back to Pete and the El Caminos, they know that this is an El Camino that's pulling up and getting the drugs out of the garbage can, so that narrows it down to pretty much anyone in the community who has access to one of those cars, which really could be anyone. I mean, you could probably hotwire one of these things if you wanted to, so, and, you know, as I'm narrowing down who it could be, Technically, it could be Randy Poole. He's got one of these cars, but I don't really think it's him. I mean, the guy never leaves his house. And I know of at least three other people who have used these cars from the neighborhood because the Rancho Equestrian District Community Center lets people just rent these cars for like 10 or $12 over the weekend if you need to move something like some furniture. It's kind of like U-Haul over there. I know that Terry Mellon has used one of those cars to move some furniture around. I don't know if you know Terry, but he actually crashed one of those cars. Terry Mellon has been injured more than anyone I've ever known. This guy has been hit by a dirt bike 13 times in three years. That's because he used to ride his recumbent bike over near this dirt bike trail, this dirt bike trail that's down by the river. He's since given up the recumbent bike. He also shattered both elbows when he was over at Janthanese's nightclub the other day. I mean, he's okay now, but I do know that he's driven one of these cars. But if you do have any information on who it might be that's doing this garbage can drug drop stuff, Message me on the Patreon page, Valley Heat Patreon page, or you can text you can text me on my email. Yeah, do that. You can email me at valleyheatpodcast at hotmail.com. I'll pass that information along to the police, and they'll take that information and put it in a file marked, never look at this again, what's for lunch? I mean, if the DEA is any indication of the quality of work they do on it, I mean, look at the DEA. The guy's doing stakeouts with his mom in the car. He's giving her rides to Marshalls and FedEx to mail her Etsy stuff. But if you remember, Pete got me this bottle of Ambien that he got from his cousin John, who's a Canadian foosball champion. And when he gave me that Ambien, it was technically illegal, and the DEA got wind of it, and they had the police go over and arrest him. I bailed him and his cousin out of jail, but then John had to go stay at Pete's house. And that upset Candace, and so she came to stay with me. Not that I invited her, but she came with her baby and then brought a bird in. But then Pete showed up because he's upset that she's over here. And anyway, I wanted to play that for you. So check this out. Hey, Pete, how are you? It's Candace here. Uh, yeah, she is actually. What are you doing here? I got nowhere else to go. Well, you can't stay here. Okay, let's hold on. Candace, I can't stay at our house. Do you have any idea how crazy foosball dudes are? This is not my problem. I ain't got anywhere else to go. Well, you can't stay here. Why? Because it's not your house. Do I? Nobody saying this at all? I need to be alone. Candace. Come on. Candace, can you come out of Phil's room? You can't lock yourself in there. Candace. Come on, talk to me for just a little bit. Just hear me out. Oh, okay, here we go. Jesse's girl. I've heard this a lot. Oh, sorry, Doug. Sorry you don't like my music. Candace, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. My fault. I'm allowed. Candace, come on. You gotta come out. Come on. Where are you going? I'm taking a shower. Oh, okay, another shower? When she's upset, she takes showers. 
You can still reach for the water too, Doug. Just put it on the tab. I don't know how many showers she's been taking, but we cannot pay for the water. Guys, bill. I do not see how you can both stay here. I don't even know how one of you can stay here. Listen, I, call that one I ain't got nowhere else to go. I guarantee you can find me something to do. What are you going to do? Are you going to build another room? This is a small house. I mean, I, you know I can take care of the pool. The pool is not an option at this point. I Listen, I, you got, I can't say no to him. John's very vital. Hey, hold on just a second. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Put me on speaker. Put me on speaker. Listen, Doug? Yes. Doug, yes. Hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You better let him stay there. What? What's going on? Well, what's going on is I'm training over here, all right? Now we're trying to get focused. Okay. I don't... How, what does that have to do with now, me? All right, look. He's going to stay there. And that's the way it is. John, I don't even know how I'm supposed to negotiate this. I didn't this. train for 20 years to lose championships. Well, you know, I understand you have to train, to but I don't see hey, what that hey, has to do with hey, me. Put that down. Don't break the table. Hello? Now, I got to go, all right? We're training. And I don't want to have to talk about this again. Okay. Well, I'm not actually asking you. Right, if, if I you lose this championship, you're both getting punched. Right? And it's not going to be one of your little weak American punches. Okay. Right? It's going to be a Canadian punch. What is a Canadian punch? Hey, Google it. Okay. You're staying at your house, Doug. That's the way it is. Well, I know that you think that's the way it is. Oh, okay. I'm so, I mean, I'm sorry about that, but you see what I'm having to deal uh, with? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Fine. We can stay here. Thank you. I'm just going to grab my bag out of the car. I'll be right back. First of all, Canadian punch. I googled it, by the way. It's a drink. It's not some kind of known way of punching a person. But I'm assuming he just means he's going to punch me pretty hard if I don't let Pete stay here while they're training for this foosball tournament. The foosball championship was supposed to be a few weeks ago, but it got postponed because John injured someone during a practice drill. They were doing these wrist drills over at used foosball tables. They do these drills where they two foosball players will kind of looks like they're shaking hands. They'll shake hands and then they each try to twist each other's wrists. It's like a resistance exercise. It looks kind of like arm wrestling, but it's wrist wrestling. And John was doing this exercise with someone and the other guy got injured because John punched him right in the head really hard and no one even knows why he did it. But the guy ended up in the hospital and you'd think John would be disqualified from the tournament. Nope, not in foosball. In foosball, it's almost like they plan on postponing these tournaments because someone's going to get punched or hurt somehow. Last year, they postponed it for a month and a half because someone lit some guy's feet on fire, which is some kind of foosball thing. You know how in baseball, the manager will kick dirt on the umpire's shoes? In foosballing, you light someone's feet on fire. And it's just like some kind of tradition. There's no one that really plays professional foosball that doesn't have some kind of burn scarring on their feet. It's like rugby or hockey players with no teeth. I mean, if you're really good at foosball, you say, that guy's got foosball feet, meaning he's got some burns on his feet because he's been in some serious skirmishes. Anyway, John's at Pete's, and Pete's is at my place now, along with a parrot and a baby and Candace. I actually, I have to call Faye. My wife, like, like I said, is she still up at her dad Chuck's house, and she wanted me to go to therapy. I want to let her know that I made an attempt at therapy and that I'm trying. So I, I haven't talked to her in a while, and I'm going to call her, and you'll hear that right after this promotion. You know Gary Janthony for who he is, a guy. A man who put a drive through car wash in his driveway and upset a lot of people, but also made a lot of people pretty happy because they got their cars clean without driving all the way over to Toluca Lake or some other place that isn't right here in the neighborhood. So, hey, you don't like Gary? Uh, it's okay. You don't have to go to his car wash, but you do. I mean, let's admit it. You do. A lot of people like to call him the Bezos of Rancho, but I don't, and neither does anyone else. That's just Gary who wrote this down for me to say. But it's not going to get said again, because that's a one-time deal for Gary. That's one pass. But back to Gary, maybe you've gone to his pizzeria in the backyard, or his brewery in the backyard, or to his wife Val's living room wine and cheese in their living room. And of course, there's Janthony's 80s-style arcade, which closed down briefly because of a neighborhood protest against Gary's favorite game, Dragon's Lair, which a lot of people think is the worst 80s video game ever created. And they're right, but he's not paying me to say that. I'm just saying that because it needs to be said. Anyway, you all know Gary, and you know Gary Janthony's never been a stranger who's afraid of controversy. What? A stranger who's afraid of controversy? I think he means to say he's never been a stranger to controversy, and he's never 
Well, he's never been a stranger to controversy, and he's also never been afraid of controversy. Why don't you just say one or the other? How about we start this whole process with Gary proofreading the copy he sends me? There's big news on the Janthony front. The arcade is back during the day, and at night, get ready. Gary's Garage is no longer just an arcade. Starting at 9 p.m. every night of the week, Gary's Garage becomes Janthony's Night Garage, the Burbank Rancho Equestrian District's first ever nightclub. All right, so I'm just gonna stop that for a second. So Gary has opened a nightclub across the street in the garage. They open at uh, so they open at 9 p.m. and they're open until 4 a.m. Legally, they have to close at two, but they just close that for storefront and then they're open till four, just because no one's really checking up on them. And people stumble out of there drunk and they're running through that car wash. They're swiping their credit cards and running through the car wash. And a lot of people have gotten their face burned with hot wax. And then there's this song, this this song you just heard in the promo. Listen to this. I hear this all night long. Listen. They play that song at least 14 times a night. And, I mean, they play other stuff, too. But they play that in between sets. And it's got to be some kind of drinking game or something. And then if you do get to sleep, you're going to wake up again when that drive through car wash starts back up and drunk people start running through it. And Gary's son, Tony, he comes out and he runs it like it's a carnival ride or something. And he's got this mint classic El Camino and everyone piles into the back of it and they ride through it like that movie Car Wash with Warren Beatty. And that's what they're doing. They're all piling into the little pickup truck style thing in the El Camino and they're driving through it and screaming. And when Warren Beatty drove through the car wash, they played that song Car Wash. But that's not the song that Tony's playing when he drives through. He's playing this song. And you hear that that pulsing sound there? That's the thing that really gets me more than anything. It's it's part of the song. It goes on forever, and it's like the sound is inside your head. I mean, I'm laying there. I took an Ambien, and it's so late. I'm in this weird haze like I've been bitten by a rattlesnake, and I'm thinking, is this even real? Is this actually happening? Am I being abducted by aliens in some kind of space rave? Who listens to this? I mean, you wake up to this strobe nightmare at 4.30 in the morning on Ambien, and then you walk into your kitchen, and you got a parrot just saying Michael Douglas over and over. I mean, that, those are some hard nights. It goes on forever. I don't think this song has an actual ending. I think they just turn it down every once in a while and then turn it back up sometimes. All right, turns out you can get enough, and we hit that mark about five minutes ago. But that song goes on forever. There's like five different sections to it, and I know all of them by heart because they're playing all night long. But like I was saying, I got to call my wife, Faye. She's still up at her dad Chuck's house because she had asked me to see a therapist. And as you know, I went and saw that guy, Leon, and that didn't work out so well. But I wanted her to know that I gave it a shot, and so I'm going to give her a call. Well, I'm not going to actually give her a call because she's not picking up her phone. Ever since a couple weeks ago, we, she found out that Candace was here, and she was pretty upset about that. So she's not picking up her phone. So what I'll do is I'll call Chuck, and hopefully he'll put her on. I mean, I'm sure she knows that Pete's here now and the parrot's here and everything because I'm sure Phil filled her in on everything. <clears throat> All right, I'm just stalling because I really don't want to talk to Chuck, but I'm going to have to go through Chuck to talk to her and I'm just psyching myself up. Anyway, let's just dial and let's just do this. Well, so I guess the whole ambient ring lives there. Hi, Chuck. How's it going? So let me just clarify, and you can help me with this. Okay, go ahead. You've got the pool guy there. You've got okay. the pool guy's wife there. Mm -hmm. You've got the pool guy's child there. Okay. And 
you have his parrot there. Is that the right well, number? Well, it's actually not his parrot. It's uh, Candace's brother's parrot. Well, you know, feel free to leave out the details that do not matter to the point I'm making. Right, okay. Uh, so what does your son feel about the veritable invasion that has occurred in his house? Well, I think he's doing the best he can under the circumstance. Wait a second. He's over here. So I can ask him. He's over at your house? Phil and my daughter are right here. And uh, you know what I've got? What? I've got a warm familial home. Okay. You know what you've got? What What do I have? Junkies and pool boys. You know, I actually just wanted to talk to Faye because she had said she wanted me to go to therapy, and I wanted to talk to her about that. Well, you know what I say? I say you need a hypnotist. Maybe they could hypnotize you into being a good father and a man. Okay. I mean, I'll take that remark. Fine. And maybe then you wouldn't be driving around in a Subaru taking care of people's parrots and housing drug dealers. Okay, I mean, I drive a Subaru. I don't know why that's an issue. Phil would like to talk to you for a minute. Okay, great. Yes, can I talk to him, please? Hi. Um, so you went up to Chuck's, huh? I just never want to hear that parrot ever again. I mean, I understand. I definitely get it. Did you see my jellyfish? Yeah, of course. I mean, that shouldn't be a problem. There's a list of instructions by the tank. Okay. Be careful of the tiger fish because it's poisonous and you don't want it to bite you. Oh, there's a tiger fish in there too. Okay. Also, sunshine. If he stings you, that's a hospital visit for sure. Okay, right. And sunshine's the jellyfish? If he manages to sting you. That, that's a serious problem. Okay, I'll definitely be careful with the jellyfish. Is mom there? Also, the, uh, the stonefish. Just don't go near that. The stonefish? It's like the deadliest fish. If it gets you, it'll kill you in like an hour. How many venomous fish do you have in the tank? Uh, six? I mean, is it even safe for you to have this tank? A Bond villain wouldn't have a tank this dangerous. They're, they're interesting. This is like a drug dealer style fish tank. Do you really need this? Okay, well, I'm not a drug dealer. Right, I'm not saying that. I just... You know what? Never mind. I'll no, just... I'm happy to do it. I'm going to do it. Can you just do this one thing for me? Yes, I'm happy to do it. Did I say the thing about the stonefish? You did. I'll be careful oh, with stonefish. Okay. Cool. Here's mom. Yes. Hi. I just want to say hi. How can I help you? Sorry, what did you say? What can I do to help you? What do you mean to help me? Do you not feel like you've somehow subconsciously dismantled your life? You f feel like I've dismantled my uh, life? Your wife is not in, in your house. Your son also no longer lives there. Okay, I mean, she that's... didn't have the cool uh -huh. people living in the house and their baby and the, also the parrots. Okay, but... To be clear, there's only one parrot here. It's not a bunch of parrots. I okay. No, it's still a pain. I just wanted to clarify. It's one parrot too many. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can see that. I'll take that um, Just to make it clear, no one lives in your house anymore except for two I'm just, people. I don't know why baby, you're saying my house. And a parrot. And you. I mean, it's our house. But none of your immediate family. Right. And I mean, like I'm saying, it's temporary. Um, who got his wife? Well, what was that sound? Sorry, my phone's running out of batteries. Your family's running out of batteries. I'm, okay, I mean, I'll take that remark. The plug for your family is you going to therapy. Have you gone to therapy? Because it's, it's pretty simple. Um, yeah, I did go to therapy, and that's actually why I wanted to talk to you. Actually, though, the guy that I saw didn't end up being a good fit, but I am going to find somebody what who is the right... What do you mean, wasn't a good fit? Well, it's, we got into an argument. What did you get into an argument about? Well, he told me he was a published author, and I said, oh, really, a publishing company? Publish your book? Okay. And then he said, oh, well, yeah, because I'm a publishing company. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay, so you're not actually a published what? author. Well, I mean, he told me he published a self-help so book. Whether or not and, he's a publisher or published is, not, is irrelevant. Uh, I mean, irrelevant? Is, are you sure that's the word you want to use? Okay. I don't know if I'd say I irrelevant. Gotta, I got to go now. I got to think. I got to. Okay. Well, I love you. Give me the phone. Well, Doug, it was good talking to you. Very educational yet again. Okay, Chuck. Thank you. Oh, and if you ever find yulself covered in blood and burying a body up on Mulholland Drive, okay. just do your best and try to turn yourself in as quickly as possible because the right. quicker you get to the cops, the nicer they are about the Well, sentence. thanks for getting on the phone, Chuck. Not a problem. All right, so she probably didn't hear me say I love you, and Chuck probably took the phone before she had a chance to respond or she didn't hear. But that's the end of this episode, and hopefully I can get her to come back with Phil soon, and I can get Pete and Candace to get back in their own house. This episode was sponsored by Janny Cakes, Jan Robinson's Janny Cakes. It's ice cream for breakfast. If you want ice cream for breakfast, you can have it because Janny Cakes is ice cream for breakfast. It's also brought to you by the guy who called me a lunatic, the therapist Leon Driscoll, who wrote a book called I Can't Wait to Never See You Again, 
If you got someone in your life that's toxic, you can just move on. Or you can just do what we all do, which is just deal with it for the rest of your life. All right, and that's it for this episode of Valley Heat. I'm Doug Duguay. Take it easy. Oh, and I'll leave you with this song from Cephalopods or People. Cinema.